Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here with yet another vintage computer video. And you know, the voice in which I said that almost makes it sound as though it's practically begging to have an incredibly cheesy reverberation effect applied to it in post-production. But fear not, for right now at least, your ears are safe from such indiscretions, though obviously future performance cannot and perhaps even should not be guaranteed. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see, where should I even start with this video? Well, I was out and about today, taking care of business, performing chores, and running assorted errands, when I decided that in the course of doing all that work, I might as well have some fun along the way and visit the thrift stores that happen to be on my path. Now all of the thrift stores that I frequent have some pretty cool stuff, obviously, or there wouldn't be any point in continuing to go to them, and some of them even have pretty attractive prices on the stuff that they collect, which is important when your budget runs as close to nil as mine does. Unfortunately, all of the thrift stores also have a very disappointing aspect to their operation, and that is the fact that almost none of them will sell used personal computers. And there is one here that makes an exception to that that actually will sell anything they get, but they don't get computers hardly at all. In fact, most of the donations they get are not of things that would happen to interest me. However, there is one thrift store that I have had some luck in persuading to sell computers to me in the past. I even wanted to help them start a program to refurbish the worthwhile computers that they happened to get, but I couldn't manage to pull that off as the director of the facility got cold feet, and ultimately they wouldn't even sell me computers under the table any longer. Well, I was at that particular store today, and I saw this sitting on one of the recycling bins waiting to be pounded and crushed into who knows what for its next role in life, and I decided, you know, I don't really have a good feeling about this. I don't think they'll say yes. But as proof that hope springs eternal and it never hurts to ask, well, look what followed me home. It is a Hewlett Packard Vectra VL24 33S powered by Intel inside. You know, right there is one of the things that certainly hasn't changed in the 20 some years it's been since this machine was the new hotness of its time. Intel and AMD both still proudly proclaim via stickers on the front of respective computers powered by their microprocessors that they are the ones running the show. So perhaps change is the only constant there truly is, but at least the stickers haven't changed a whole lot over the years. And this computer, despite its relatively low clock speed and undoubtedly very minimal specifications clearly is fast because as you can see right there on the front panel it proclaims that it is zoom equipped the zoom equipped notation however has nothing whatsoever to do with the microprocessor or the computer itself rather it simply reflects the fact that this computer has a modem that was manufactured by a company known as zoom telephonics inside it now, modems are certainly not the business that they used to be, but Zoom Telephonics is very much still in business today, and they have actually diversified their product portfolio such that they now manufacture, or at least distribute, wireless routers, DSL devices, cable modems, and I think at one point, possibly even basic video editing and capture hardware and software solutions. But don't quote me on that. Now, for those of you who have been paying attention, you'll notice that the case on my prize is actually somewhat ajar at the moment. There is a reason for this. If we look at the back, you'll see that I have been engaged in computer safe cracking 101. <laughs> there is a case lock back here, and it is very definitely in the locked position. But unlike the vast majority of these machines that I have seen over time, the keys, which were once zip-tied to the case here, and in fact the zip-tie did follow me home, so I have no idea how I've managed to liberate it between then and now, the keys have unfortunately disappeared, leaving me to crack the machine open the hard way. However, the hard way was not very hard, which is a good thing, because I'm opposed to doing any more than the absolute minimum work that I have to do in order to get something done. This computer case yielded very easily to simple application of a table knife and splaying out the side of the case just enough that it would clear the lock tab that you see right there. Another thing that you can see about this computer, if the camcorder will pick it up, is the gradual yellowing that has taken place on the exposed case surfaces. You may also be able to see where the monitor, <coughs> excuse me, once rested on top of the machine as it's nowhere near 
is yellowed in that area. Wow, boy, excuse me once again, I am sorry for that. It's also possible to note that this computer has either spent some time in a very dingy and damp place, or perhaps its previous owners actually threw it outside for a while. I don't know, but the rust is clearly visible there at the bottom of the expansion card cage. So that's a look at the exterior of this computer for the most part. I actually do have a fancier version of a machine that uses this same case, a Vectra XA, that I have upgraded from its original clock doubling 486 DX2 microprocessor to a Pentium Overdrive. And that machine has, instead of an, an artifact on the front of the case and inside on the framework, an actual infrared port on the front, which though I have never used it, could certainly have been a convenient feature back in the day for synchronizing personal digital assistants or even programming it to act as a universal remote control, which can be done with most infrared chipsets that were used in personal computers when infrared ports were popular and common. But I digress. Let's go ahead and pop the cover on this treasure and see just what it is I've got inside here and what kind of shape it's in. Internally, this computer seems to be in very good, if not excellent, and certainly surprisingly clean condition. In fact, I only had to remove a couple of cobwebs from the machine. There really was no appreciable amount of dust inside it to speak of. It's certainly in much better condition internally than it was externally, as prior to my cleaning it off, this outer cover had some kind of a greasy substance on it, almost like it had maybe been used in a kitchen environment or near a deep fat fryer or something like that that would have put oily residue into the air and made the machine greasy to the touch. Let's take a look at what's inside here. Right away you can see the Zoom Telephonics ISA modem. This machine has only an ISA expansion bus in it, unlike the later version I have where there is mixed PCI and ISA expansion available. Underneath the hard drive, there is a curious empty space in every one of these Hewlett Packard desktops that I own from this particular series. This is the first time I've actually seen one that suggests something was planned to go there. That almost looks as though it might be a kind of... Um, it might be a new bus connector, though obviously Hewlett Packard would not have been employing a new bus expansion system in a PC compatible machine such as this one. I don't know what that was intended for, and I have never seen a machine with that populated or even with anything in place there. So basically, it's just wasted space. You can see that while the hard drive says Hewlett Packard on it, it is actually a quantum model. 210 megabytes in size, I believe it says. Yes, 210 megabytes AT bus type IDE, which makes sense in a 486 machine such as this. I can remember when having a 270 megabyte hard drive as my first real multimedia capable and equipped with Microsoft Windows computer did back in the day was really something. Of course, these days, you know, with our multi terabyte hard drives, it's hard to imagine that we ever existed that way, but we definitely did. Another thing that has definitely changed drastically, I get some comments periodically on my videos involving old computers talking about how much power they use. Don't they use a lot of power? Aren't they particularly wasteful of energy? Well, take a look at the maximum and peak output ratings on this power supply and you can decide for yourself. When's the last time you saw any modern desktop or tower computer with a power supply that had a rating of 74 and a half watts under normal conditions and a peak output rating for 20 seconds maximum of 100 watts worth of power. <laughs> I think you'll be quite a long time looking for one. I would love to know how that 20 second maximum figure was arrived at if they actually tried loading these power supplies and seeing if they blew up though this being a Delta electronics power supply and therefore hopefully a very high quality. I would hope that if it is overloaded in such a severe way that it would simply shut down. One thing this power supply definitely does have is a nice thermally controlled fan. And you can see if you look at the fan, there's not even a whole lot of dust on that to speak of. This machine was really very clean inside. So let's take a look at the motherboard. To start things off, here is a look at the Intel 8486SX microprocessor clocked at a blistering 33 megahertz. Remember the days when microprocessors didn't need any kind of a heat sink? 
Those are certainly long past for the most part. <laughs> this machine is equipped with a so-called Socket 3 microprocessor socket. You'll notice that there is an extra empty row of pins around the main microprocessor. This would allow the end user to install an optional Pentium Overdrive microprocessor upgrade clocked at either 63 or 83 megahertz and giving the computer a significant boost not only in speed but also the ability for the microprocessor to execute Pentium specific instructions thus increasing its performance much further over competing 486 class upgrades such as those marketed by AMD, IBM, Texas Instruments and even Cyrix. Unfortunately that speed came with a bit of a penalty and that penalty has to do with the next item in line which is the level 2 cache upgrade socket. Unfortunately if you install a Pentium Overdrive microprocessor you may find that the machine is completely unstable or just has gained an amusing personality when you combine the Pentium Overdrive microprocessor with level 2 cache, especially right back cache. I might make a video talking about some of the fun you can have with that in the future. Going on past the level 2 cache expansion socket, we have two 72-pin SIM sockets, both of them loaded with 4 megabyte SIMs, although they are of slightly different composition. I would presume the combination works nevertheless. You can see the onboard system speaker. Hewlett Packard seems to have gotten a heck of a deal on these things as I've seen them on every motherboard that they designed from these 486 class machines all the way up to their early, early Pentium 2 efforts. Sitting right next to that is the lithium battery that keeps the system time date and BIOS settings intact. Um, that is definitely a bit of a departure for a 486 era Hewlett Packard machine as a number of their computers actually used a supercapacitor or even a nickel cadmium battery usually mounted to the expansion card riser. Now I've never had a problem with one of those batteries or supercapacitors failing but those machines have to be kept plugged in all the time if you expect them to keep their time, date, and BIOS settings intact. However, there is one very interesting design aspect to this motherboard that some of you may have noticed. Over here is the Cirrus Logic Video Graphics Integrated Circuit, one of the um, first integrated graphics accelerators brought to the market. Uh, it was a low-cost offering in that Cirrus Logic integrated not only the video accelerator itself, but also the random access memory digital to analog converter or RAMDAC, which with most any other graphics accelerator on the market at the time was an external part and would be seen on this motherboard if it used anyone else's graphics. But the really interesting thing here is not so much the graphics accelerator itself, but rather the video memory. Now, this machine clearly was designed to use a type of memory known as a ZIP. I don't know exactly what that stands for, but instead of using standard ZIPs, Hewlett Packard devised some kind of a curious looking memory module. These almost look like tiny little 30 pin SIMs with some of the pins simply having been cut off of them. I've never I've never seen anything quite like this and I don't know if that was an effort to give this machine more video memory that could be provided for in a zip package or just what that had to do with anything. I'm not actually sure why they did that. That's a very curious design and like I said previously something that I have never seen before. Nestled underneath this metal cover is something that you won't see used very often and you certainly won't see it on modern video cards. That is the so-called Visa Feature Connector, the Video Electronic Standards Association. What that allowed for was for something such as an expansion card or a TV tuner to either tap the onboard video signal for further processing or even and capture or to introduce something known as a video overlay to the outgoing signal before it was mixed and sent on to the monitor. Unfortunately that approach was fraught with some compatibility problems. It also saw use in um, hardware DVD decoder cards present on a lot of computers in the early 2000s and the late 1990s that lacked the computational power to decode video from a DVD in real time. 
Fortunately, that was a situation that did not last very long. And of course, you can see the connectors for the hard drive right here. The floppy drive ribbon cable is right behind that. And then the power connector is also there as well. And then there is a connection leading to the front panel. You can also see some guides back here in this plastic assembly for another rarity that you won't hardly see anymore. And that is a full-length expansion card. Yes, indeed, folks. There used to be a time when an expansion card could run all the way back from the slot bracket area of the computer clear out to the front of the system. And a system like this might not even be uh, wide enough or long enough to accept <laughs> a truly gargantuan expansion card. Such things were pretty rare back then. They are practically unheard of today. So I'll go ahead and slap this thing back together, find a keyboard and a mouse, and we'll just power this thing up and see what happens. Now, part of the reason I was allowed to acquire this computer has to do with the fact that I made them a promise that I would wipe the hard drive, and so that is exactly what is going to happen. I am going to boot it up, see if it at least starts, but once we get past that, the hard drive is going to be erased because I don't want to abuse the trust that these people put into me by being willing to sell me this computer system. I actually went ahead just now and used a wrench to bend the lock tab inward so that it will not interfere with the proper closing of the case. Many times it really doesn't take a whole heck of a lot of concerted effort to break into a computer that's locked. It just requires some care and consideration of how the designer of the case considered doing things. As you can see here, this is the most substantial bit that is responsible for giving the locking tab something to connect to. So in this case it was very easy to simply pop the computer apart. Unfortunately, if you do find a computer at a recycling center that's locked, you may find it open, and you may wonder, well, why is that unfortunate? It saves me a lot of time. Well, the simple truth of the matter is it usually means that they threw the machine around and probably damaged some of its internal parts in the process, though computer parts can definitely be surprisingly re robust when confronted with abusive treatment. In some way it seems fitting to use this, the Dell monitor that I picked up from the curbside discount store, along with that Dell Dimension B110 from a couple of weeks ago, to test this computer. By golly, <laughs> I haven't tried either one of these. I don't know if either one of them works. I do know that the gateway monitor that was alongside this Dell had bad capacitors in the vertical section at least because there was quite considerable video fold over. So this might really be a double whammy <laughs> of a demonstration video, especially if something goes bang. The only obvious thing I found wrong with the Dell monitor so far is that someone did their level best to crank the living bejesus out of these things onto the connector that had formerly, uh, <laughs> well I shouldn't say formerly had been on the B110, it's still very much attached. But the two little screws are certainly no longer with it. I had to resort just now to using this wrench that I bent the locking tab with and a screwdriver to actually get those to come loose. But now I've got a keyboard and a mouse hooked up, so let's just go ahead and turn the camcorder light off. Okay, there we go. Oh, the monitor did come to life. All right, that's a good sign. Didn't go bang, at least not yet. And let's see about the computer. Got a power light and a hard drive light. I don't hear the hard drive spinning up though. Oh, there we go. Eight megabytes of memory installed. And we have a keyboard and mouse error. Well, I'm not really surprised by that because I did not know which one was the keyboard port and which one was the mouse port. So we'll go ahead and just swap these over because that's probably why it's complaining see if I can do that on camera. I found these, I don't know where all my PS2 mice and keyboards have gone. I found these two sunning themselves in the laundry room, so they might well be worth what probably wasn't paid for them. <sighs> all right, let's try that again. See if it comes up like it ought to now. All right, eight megabytes, testing the keyboard and mouse. Hey, we passed. Testing the hard drive. Taking a long time to test the hard disk drive. <laughs> Maybe the hard drive in this machine is bad. Oh, yeah, the hard drive seems to be in trouble. 8051, hard disk error. Well, let's just go into setup then. 
configure hard disk drives. The date has definitely slipped, so the battery is not real good. But everything else seems to be, at least what I've looked at so far, seems to be set to reasonably sane values. And maybe that hard drive will just come back to work, and if it sits there and spin, spins for a while now, there it got the size right. So I don't know what it's doing. It's certainly not the happiest hard drive that I have ever heard. What parallel port modes do we get? Do we get uh, bi-directional ones on here? Yeah, we do. Centronics or bi-directional. ESMF for a monitor type. I don't know what that should be. Well, they give you a number of HP monitors that you can choose, and apparently if you have an HP monitor, it's an EMF or an ESMF. Quit that. All right, let's try saving and exiting. See if it's a little happier about passing its power on self-test now. Yeah, hard drive just spun down. That's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely having some problems with the hard drive. So I would imagine I'm probably going to have to pull the hard drive out of something else. Probably this one's either been thrown around too much or just it happened to start acting up one day and was ultimately left for dead, which wasn't too far off. But that concludes this video of the HP Vectra VL24 slash 33S personal computer. Thank you so much for watching and feel free to leave a comment if you have one. Well, it's not like me to throw in a postscript on my videos, and I really have other things that I should be doing besides playing with this machine, but apparently I just can't leave anything alone. So I took a trip over to the magical box of hard drives, over there in between those oil bottles and the IBM monitor box, and I came up with what seemed like a suitable victim for replacing this machine's fallen hard drive. I was really hoping to find something smaller underneath the uh, 528 megabyte limit because I really can't believe for a moment that a computer this old supports logical block address translation for large hard drives, but this one gigabyte Seagate Metalist was the closest thing that I happened to find. And much to my amazement, if we go ahead and power up here, you'll see in just a second, as soon as the monitor warms up, that the machine does in fact correctly identify the drive, much to my Great surprise. Let's go into system setup here, and you can actually see that it is detected at the correct capacity, but I really don't think that this BIOS is going to end up supporting logical block addressing translation, and that is certainly a project for another day. But before I go ahead and hang up on this video and close things out here, I would like to show you that this machine delivers a very interesting error message, error message when it cannot actually start. Instead of just giving you you know, um, cannot find operating system or system halted or something like that, it actually gives you a little bit of advice saying that a new hard drive may need to be partitioned and formatted.